podcast is a recording of our weekly practice. If you would like to join us in person, please visit our website at rubenmuseum.org slash meditation. We are proud to be partnering with Sharon Salzberg and teachers from the Shambhala Center. The series is supported in part by the Hamera Foundation. In the description for each episode, you will find information about the theme for that week's session, including an image of a related artwork chosen from the Rubin Museum's permanent collection. And now, please enjoy your practice. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Rubin and to our weekly mindfulness meditation practice. My name is Dawn Eshelman. For anybody who's here for the first time, anybody? A few. Welcome. Great to have you. We have been talking this month about focus, the element of focus, and what that has to do with our meditation practice. And we started off from the scientific point of view, understanding that what we focus on actually can shape physically our brains. And last week, we had a really different lens to look through, which was um, through a kind of fairy tale and uh, um, understanding of uh, kind of our life's focus, um, peeling back the layers until we get to the core. And today, we're kind of going back to our wheelhouse here. We um, are looking at a really beautiful um, object from our collection. It is this kind of gorgeous and fierce dagger, or purba. And it is a uh, a ritual dagger. Um, So it's a very important ritual tool in Tibetan Buddhism, specifically Tantric Buddhism. This was uh, created in the 17th century. It is iron and gilt brass. And it is actually, it's hard to see in this uh, image, but it's actually a three-sided blade, right? So there are, there are three kind of blades coming to a point there. Um, up, up at the uh, top of the blade, encircling it, is um, a really interesting kind of hybrid animal um, that is in the kind of wrathful Cannon, and then up the blade at the very top, you can see uh, some wrathful faces. And this, of course, all tells us that this instrument is utilized to ward off um, negative demons. Um, so we employ these kind of wrathful elements ourselves uh, to help us with that in this practice. The um, Dagger itself is used in, in many different occasions um, to ward off negativity and to really kind of ground and focus a project. For example, when a monastery is built, the first thing that, that, is, uh, that occurs, a sort of a groundbreaking ceremony, is to take this ritual dagger, a lama would uh, use it in, in that ceremony and pierce the ground with it to be kind of the, the very first and grounding element um, to, uh, to that new creation. And so we can take that symbolism into other acts as well and, um, and understand that the uh, dagger is, uh, you know, is really um, symbolizing this sort of piercing of uh, negative um, demons, uh, really kind of, in a way, focusing on them in order to pierce them and therefore dispelling them and warding them off, clearing the ground uh, so that uh, something new can begin. So uh, we are welcoming a new teacher here today, and I'm delighted that she can join us for our series. Uh, Dr. Shante Paradigm Smalls is here with us today. She is a teacher and meditation instructor in the Shambhala lineage of Tibetan Buddhism. And so in addition to welcoming Shante today, we are welcoming the Shambhala Center as a partner in this program. She's a student of Sakyong Mipam Rinpoche and has been a member of Shambhala and the New York City Shambhala Sangha since 2006. And Shante is an assistant professor of English at the St. John's University in Queens, New York. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Shante Paradigm Smalls. Good 
Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much, Don and the Ruben, uh, Sharon Salzberg, and the New York Insight Center for welcoming me and Shambhala um, back to the Ruben. Um, uh, I think Ethan Nickturn used to, Shasha Ethan Nickturn used to teach here, um, who is also a, a member of Shambhala, my meditation instructor. And um, I'm really excited. Thank you all for coming out on your lunch hour or uh, <laughs> this time. Um, it's really lovely to see all your faces. And this is really on the spot. <laughs> so that's great, uh, talking about focus. Um, There's a real sense of being on the spot with you all. And um, I hope we can have a nice, um, give a little pithy uh, talk of relating the purba to um, more meditation practice. Um, then we'll practice for about 20 minutes of a guided meditation with enough space for you to kind of sit. Um, uh, and we'll walk through that and then we'll have some Q&A. Okay, so I'm gonna, my notes here. So as Don so eloquently said, this is a purba or a ritual uh, dagger, Tibetan ritual uh, dagger. Um, and you can learn more about this particular dagger, uh, I think after, uh, during the tour. Uh, but I'm gonna talk about the principle that this purba, or the principles that it represents. Um, so one of the elements is this, the three-sided aspect, the three-sided blade. Um, and it has to do with the um, three Buddhist realms, um, uh, heaven, earth, and humanity, or heaven, earth, and environment, depending on translation. Uh, and not heaven, maybe as we might uh, typically understand it, uh, but the qualities of um, uh, view, um, earth, and kind of practicality, and putting those things together. So um, this, this purba, um, um, represents uh, enlightened action. Um, and so it's associated with um, Yidams or meditation deities, but particularly Vajrakalaya, who is the Buddha of um, action, of enlightened action. Um, and that, uh, that deity um, is from the Nigma lineage. I don't know how much you all know about the different schools of Tibetan Buddhism, but uh, the Nigma school is the um, oldest school. Um, and so in Shambhala, the Vajrakalaya practices were introduced actually not that long ago, but about a decade ago. The practices themselves are, of course, very, very old, as old as the Nimra lineage, but in our tradition, um, they had only been practiced by um, our lineage holders, um, and then they were introduced to senior students, and so in the last decade, they've rolled out um, as um, uh, as, as practices, actually, as I was preparing today, and I was sort of, oh, like, maybe I could find something. And I found in one of my chant books, actually, a, the daily practice for Vajrakalaya. And I just sort of thought, oh, that's really auspicious. Um, so the purba, or the practice associated with, uh, with Vajrakalaya, um, is focused on removing obstacles. So uh, phys physical obstacles, but also working with obstacles of mind, obstacles in our lives, um, and protecting the environment um, of truth and kind of kindness. Um, and those things flourish as a result of kind of that genuine action. And so in relationship to focus, I wanna soften the word focus a little bit. I don't know for you all, but for me, when I hear focus or when I think of focus, um, it's very intense. It's a, little bit, it's a little bit sharp and that's okay. It can be one pointed, but um, there's also an aspect of gentleness in relationship to focus in meditation. And so one way to think about focus in relationship to meditation, and this purba is actually can be an object of meditation, for instance, if you're doing some kind of visualization practice. But one way to think about um, focus is to think about an object of meditation. So for many traditions, the basic object of meditation is some relationship to the breath. Um, and sometimes when I'm working with new meditation students or um, talking to newer practitioners, they'll say, you know, they'll get very um, athletic about <laughs> meditation. And it becomes, and it is a body practice because we obviously we use our body, but there's a kind of tensing. And the practice is really um, meant to help us relax. Not relax in the sense of 
fall asleep, although I fall asleep many times on the cushion, um, not to be too loose, but to help us to um, step away from our sort of habitual everyday kind of patterns and really feel what it's like to feel the breath as it enters and leaves and moves the body. So we think, we talk about a lot of times across many meditation traditions, the object of meditation. And in my tradition, we talk about the relationship between uh, mindfulness and awareness or shamatha vipassana, um, which basically means peaceful abiding or can be translated into mindfulness and vipassana, which means awareness basically. And that the practice of shamatha of sitting practice where you um, work with your breath uh, in a sitting posture, whether it's in a chair, which we all are, um, or on a cushion, um, that the working with the breath and working with the thoughts that come up as one is sitting in a chair and breathing helps us to work with our mindfulness, placing our mind on an object, right? And that work of placing your mind of a, of, on an object, continual placement of your mind on an object because the mind wanders or gets taken away by thoughts, naturally causes us to get in touch with our awareness. So we can think of mindfulness as you're um, listening to me speak or you're, you're looking at me, but if the door opens, you might be aware of that, your environment. So this kind of, um, there's a, a way that we can pay attention to what's happening to a, to a thing, but we're also aware of our environment. And so that's the relationship between mindfulness and awareness. Um, and so that's kind of a, an expansion, a gentle expansion or a gentle unfolding of this idea of focus, that we gently place our attention on our object of meditation, and that helps us to become uh, aware of our environment, external environment and internal environment. Does that, does that make sense? Um, and then I just want to say one last thing about um, this in relation to the connection between uh, meditation, the sort of the ritual or the um, idea, uh, concept of the purba and uh, how that's sort of enacted in, in certain or thought about in certain uh, tantric um, traditions. So one of the uh, concepts that this purba is related to is something called the four karmas. Has anyone ever heard of the four karmas? So this has to do with um, skillful action. And it sounds actually really, really cool. Um, and it is really, really cool. But it's much less um, uh, kind of violent than it, it sounds. So they're, they're related uh, to these four concepts of pacifying, enriching, magnetizing, and the purba would also be associated with the last one, which is destroying. So we always start with the ground of, of pacifying, um, pacifying our own minds, pacifying situations. Um, if you're trying to be helpful, if you work with people, or if you're working with yourself on the subway or on the street or something, that you always, the ground is always pacifying, right? Um, De-escalation in other kinds of language. And uh, enriching has to do with what can I bring to the situation? How can I work with the situation? Um, and then there's magnetizing, which has to do with how we bring people together and how we um, sort of bring harmony and uh, community, how we uh, work, work with our situation. What kind of skills can we bring to a situation to um, make it as robust as possible? So those, those three things maybe seem different than the last one or, or contradictory to the last one, destroying. And destroying is not you know, um, necessarily breaking you know, things apart, but it's a um, skillful way of cutting harmful action. A lot of people hear that and they want to go right to the cutting. <laughs> they, maybe they have someone in mind like, yeah, I want to cut that, you know, cut that person or cut that situation. But we really have, it's more like, um, it's more like a ladder, like you can't get to the top of the ladder by necessarily, well you could, I guess, jump, but you'd probably hurt yourself. Um, you have to 
take the rungs. So these are uh, relational. Um, so I think maybe that's all I'll say about that. And maybe I'll ask you to take a comfortable seat. And so So um, I assume, how many of you uh, meditate? Wow, that's great. So, and do you meditate regularly? Is that a good, great, excellent. How many people do not meditate? Okay, thank you, one or two, okay. Um, that's okay as well. So I, I'm assuming many people have different practices, uh, Perhaps you belong to a particular tradition or you have a particular way of meditating, and that's excellent. And this, is, this is not a conversion uh, session, but I'm going to teach what I know, which is the uh, uh, technique, the basic sitting technique that um, I was introduced to when I first came to Shambhala in, 20, in 2006, and the basic technique we teach and that I teach to students. So we're all sitting, that's great. And if you can, um, uh, the, most thing, the most important thing is to be comfortable and to try to have a sense of relaxation and a sense of um, feeling your own inherent intelligence and your own inherent beauty and humanity, which is such a gift, the gift of being alive and being with each other. In terms of the physical technique, we, as you all are, we sit upright with our feet planted firmly on the ground. So the bottom half of the body, there's a sense of groundedness in the earth. I may just stand up for a second. If, hopefully that's not too, um, but um, there's a sense of groundedness in the earth almost like mountain pose, if you know that from yoga. And there's a sense that um, through our body, we're connected to this um, terrestrial plane that we're on. So just feel your body, your feet, your sits bones sinking into the earth, the chair as representative of the earth. Just feel that sensation. If you like, you can place your hands on your knees or your thighs, or if it feels more comfortable on the arms of the chair, just a relaxed sense of being here. I'll just model that. The upper part of your body is upright. It's as if you're... Um, Torso and up is like the stalk of a beautiful blooming sunflower. There's dignity as your body reaches for the sky or the heaven concept. And the front of your body is soft and relaxed. It's open. The heart center, which is the not quite the heart, but it's the center of your being in your chest area. The heart is also in Tibetan Buddhism, the heart and the mind are one. So the heart is actually located, as they say, the heart is the seat of the mind. The back of your body is firm, not tight, not rigid, but just upright, supporting you. So you work with the balance of soft front, firm back, right? Okay, great. Now, here's where it may be a little bit different for some of you. And if this doesn't feel comfortable, feel free to disregard this instruction. The gaze is actually open. And your gaze is uh, downward, about, um, you sort of look through your, the person in front of you, about six to eight feet in front of you, where your eye is just taking in the whole environment. It's a soft focus. You're seeing with your whole eye. If that feels uncomfortable, you don't like it, 
feel free to disregard it. And finally, the object of your meditation is actually to feel the sensation of your body as it breathes. Feel the sensation of breath coming in. And as it goes out, and just place your attention on that sensation of the body breathing. And when thoughts arise as they do, that is the nature of mind, if they take you away from your object of meditation, which is the sensation of the body breathing, just lightly, gently, like a feather touching a bubble, say thinking, and return your attention to the sensation of your body breathing. So we'll sit, I'll ring the um, gong here, or the rin, and then I'll uh, ring us out when we're done. Thank you and have uh, an amazing day. Enjoy this beautiful day in this beautiful museum. Mm -hmm. That concludes this week's practice. If you'd like to attend in person, please check out our website, rubenmuseum.org slash meditation to learn more. Sessions are free to Rubin Museum members, just one of the many benefits of membership. Thank you for listening. Have a mindful day.